I'm Bay McFarlane, and I'm here with Monsignor Stuart Swetland, and he has offered graciously to give a message of teaching, inspiration, and encouragement to those who participate in the upcoming retreat for separated faithful. That's those who are divorced or separated who still remain faithful to their wedding. And um, the participants of the retreat use this book, The Gift of Self. So we'll be talking about some of the things that are in the themes of the book. Um, thank you, Monsignor Swetland. Can you tell our listeners just a little about yourself so those who have never heard of you on Relevant Radios would um, just get a little idea? Yes, I guess um, the, the most people, I'm obviously a, a Roman Catholic priest. I'm a president right now of Donnelly College in Kansas City, Kansas, and pastor of Our Lady in St. Rose Catholic Church, also here in Kansas City, Kansas. I'm a professor of leadership and Christian ethics. My academic background is I have a doctorate from the St. John Paul II uh, Institute for Marriage and Family. Uh, there I focused uh, on the social teachings of the church, but obviously my licentiate and doctorate uh, in married life is part of the, you know, from that institute is part of the focus. Uh, so I'm a, moral, I'm a moral theologian by, you know, by training in the academic world. I guess the most other important fact is that I'm an adult convert to Catholicism. Uh, I was um, brought up a Protestant, a Lutheran. I, 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 dro I drifted away from Christianity in my teens and early 20s. And while I was studying at Oxford University, I had the good fortune of coming in contact with devout Catholics who helped me see the truth of the faith um, as I was studying philosophy and politics and economics. And um, uh, the, the church's teaching in these areas really mesmerized me because it was the best uh, that I could see anywhere. And uh, that led me to take seriously the claims of the Catholic Church, which I fully believe that it's a church founded by Jesus Christ with all the teachings Christ intended us to have for our salvation, our sanctification, and our glorification ultimately in heaven by the grace of God. Perfect. Perfect for us. Um, the first question I wanted to ask you about is what are the wedding promises and what's their theological root? Right. You know, I, the, we have a new marriage right, so I have a, a relatively new book. Uh, you know, it's, it's been a new translation that's been approved, moved by, moved new by my standards in the sense I was ordained, you know, over 30 years ago. Um, you know, and, then, and as I always like to do in the celebration of matrimony, matrimony which I, I did a lot as a chaplain. Uh, I spent many years of my life chaplains to universities. Uh, now I'm on the dark side in administration of universities, very dangerous thing. But um, I'm always um, uh, enjoy celebrating the sacrament because we ask the questions very publicly, very openly. Uh, the questions, as it says in the new right, the questions before consent. We want to make sure that the couple is freely entering into this uh, covenant relationship. And that's how we see it. We see it as a covenant relationship, not a contractual relationship. You know, our, our, we're a very litigious society. Our, our society loves contracts, but contracts are uh, very specific. They have beginnings, they have ends, they have, uh, you know, um, ways that the, uh, whatever the contract relationship is, can be dissolved. That's not what uh, matrimony is. Matrimony is a covenant relationship, an open-ended relationship, like God's covenant relationship with us. Matter of fact, the scriptures say this all the time, that God loves us the way that a bridegroom loves his bride. He lays down his life for her, that total gift of self that makes uh, a relationship nuptial, marital. So we ask questions of consent. We ask, have you been coerced, right? We ask, and we wanna make sure you, you're coming here freely and wholeheartedly. We ask, uh, are you prepared um, to love and honor each other for as long as you both shall live? Uh, and then we ask, are you prepared to accept children lovingly from God and bring them up according to the law of Christ and his church? So we ask those questions and it speaks to exactly this free consent where you give yourself totally as gift to the other and receive the other uh, totally as gift. And that gift includes all possible futures, because if you look at the vows, they slightly differ uh, in language, but they all say the same basic thing. When you take the vow, it's I take you, in the case of the groom, to be my wife. I promise to be faithful to you in good times and in bad, in sickness and in health, uh, to love you and honor you all the days of my life. 
just that one, you see clearly the church understands there could be such a thing as bad times. There could be such a thing as sickness. You know, in the other one we talked, the more Americanized one, uh, richer or poor, there can be such a thing as a, a, a marriage that, that where the couple struggles financially. We, we understand that. We say it right up front because what the couple is committing to is an I love you forever, no matter what. And that's the, the, the foundation of this covenant, the total gift of self and receiving the other, where I accept all possible futures. The church says, we don't know what the future holds. It could be good, it could be bad. It could be richer, it could be poorer, it could be sickness, it could help. Whatever the future is, you're committing to each other for the, uh, for, uh, the, uh, as, both, as long as both of you are alive. Then for the case of separated faithful, one, the other spouse, either says things like, I don't want to be married to you anymore, or I've fallen out of love with you, or I just have to, I just have to divorce you. I have to. So how does one, how does a separated faithful consider their marriage promises when that happens? Yeah. Well, there is such a thing as a valid marriage that is a difficult or one of estrangement. The canon law even provides for this. I'm not a canon lawyer. I don't play one on television or on the radio. I'm a moral theologian, but the canon law is clear on this. There can be such a thing as a recognized separation. You could imagine, for example, um, uh, uh, let's say a husband who is struggling uh, with maybe a, a addiction or um, is abusive to uh, his uh, family in some way. There might be a need to live separately. That doesn't dissolve the marriage. It just says for the safety and health uh, and the salvation, perhaps, of the couple, they need to live at separate addresses, but they're still married to one another because the vow is the vow is the vow. Uh, and it, it is a commitment no matter what. And now, I was in the military for years, so I saw lots and lots of marriages where the husband had to, because of deployment, be significantly away from um, you know, the children and the family. Those were temporary things, but they were significant. Um, and we understood that, you know, separation does come that way by vocation, uh, by service. But there's also the, the, the separation that can be, if you will, forced upon us by the circumstances where out of weakness or, or disease or sickness, there's a reason why the couple is separate for a period of time. And, and those circumstances you're describing remind me of the case where someone really does have a legitimate reason to be separated you know, like the abusive situation or terribly dangerous. Um, I would venture that maybe three quarters, I just, I'm just guessing based on, you know, my experience, that most of the people who are separated faithful aren't in a situation where they think the other spouse did something grave enough that they needed to separate. It's usually the other spouse who just comes and says, I don't love you anymore, or I can't, I just don't want to be married to you anymore. So it's like, yeah, what, it, what does one do with idea. that in light of the marriage promises? Yeah. This idea that I've fallen out of love, let's, let's, you know, as a moral theologian, I got to unpack that, okay? First of all, you know, it's interesting, just listen to that language, falling into love, falling out of love. It's almost like, you know, I, the other day I hit a pothole, you know, I fell into the pothole. You know, it's almost like an accident that happens to us. It's something right. external. Um, <clears throat> that is not the church's view of love. As a matter of fact, that's not authentically any significant thinker's view of love. Because that would leave love as an emotion only, something that can change with the wind or the weather or, you know, changing circumstances. No, love is a choice. And when I say I love someone, I say I want will and work for the true good of the other. Right. That's love understood, you know, in all its forms. Uh, so friendship love it, to love a friend is to want will and work for the true good of one's friend. Even to love God, you could say, it's to want, will, and work for the true good of God. What's the true good of God? Well, it's God's will, because God's will is perfect. The true good of God is God's will be done. That's why we pray for that in the Our Father, here on earth as it is in heaven. So to, that's generically what love is, to want, will, and work for the true good of the other. It has very little to do with emotions. Now, it's nice when our emotions line up with our choice, but there's plenty of times and, you know, I have friends that tell me all the time that I annoy them. <laughs> I can be annoying. Uh, and, 
you know, they'll say, I'm making the choice to love. That's their joke to me to say, what you're doing now is annoying us, but we'll, we'll still love you because we're making the choice to love. Love is a choice. And choices are things that last until we make a contrary choice. So when someone says, I fell out, uh, I'm falling out of love with you, or I fell out of love with you, either they're making a new choice where they are abandoning their commitment and their vows, or those vows and commitments were never choices, they were just emo emotive-based reactions to how one feel felt at that particular time. You know, there is, that's why the church always has held out, there is the possibility that someone didn't make a marital choice at the beginning or what's incapable of making a marital choice uh, at the beginning of a marriage. That's where annulments come in, where the church recognizes there was something wrong at the beginning. Uh, you can think most famously, I uh, just saw a case like this, um, yeah, not too far from where I live, where a, a man just lied. He had a whole nother family. He had a whole nother life. He was a bigamist. Obviously, you can't enter into a second marriage. So the first marriage, even the state in this case, recognized that that second marriage was not a valid marriage and annulled it legally because it was based on fraud. It was based on law. So there can be something defective from the beginning that makes the per one, one or the other either incapable um, uh, well, that's the best way of saying it, incapable of making that kind of commitment. Um, obviously, canon law says you have to be of a certain age because maturity, you have to be of, of a certain age to make this kind of commitment, those sort of things. But it's important that we recognize that love is a choice. And what I say in love is, I love you no matter what. I commit myself to you for the whole of life. So for those who have been sinned against, who are faithful to their commitment, and their, their spouse has abandoned them um, or has changed his or her mind, they are still called to show the fidelity of God because what's the Old Testament all full of? Plenty of examples where God says to his people, like he does in Hosea, even if you're unfaithful, chosen people, even if you're unfaithful, uh, I'm gonna remain faithful. And uh, you know that's what God does. God shows that fidelity even when we are unfaithful and, and sometimes we're called to show fidelity to people who are not in return faithful to us. That, that brings another question to my mind. You know, some of these people say, I'm not, I fell on out of love with you, but others of them just say, I don't want to be married to you anymore. And then all the lawyers and the naysayers, as I'll call them, um, will come back to the separated faithful and say, well, why would you think you can be married to someone who doesn't want to be married to you anymore? He obviously doesn't want to be married to you. You know, your marriage is ended because he doesn't want to be married to you anymore. There's no marriage there. How, how do you rebut that? Yeah. Well, part of this is uh, the problem we have today where we think our choices create reality, <laughs> right? You know, um, you, our choices last, they do create something in us. And when a couple commit themselves each to the other for the whole of life in the marital uh, a bond, and that marital bond is consummated through a marital act of one flesh union, um, that kind of act, which is per se no to, suitable for the generation of new life, that union, that bond is an unbreakable bond. It's an ontological unbreakable bond, only breakable by death itself. What God has put together, man must not divide. This is what's said at the marriage, is what's said in scripture. Uh, it's what's said by our Lord himself. A bond has been established. It exists. It's an ontological, spiritual reality. Um, you know, if I choose to say, let's say I, I'm, I'm the husband and I'm in a marital bond, and I choose to say, I don't want that anymore, my choice doesn't change reality. The reality is there, there is a matrimonial bond that has been established, a sacramental bond that has been established, assuming we're talking about marriage between two baptized persons. And you know, just because one or the other says, I don't want that to exist, doesn't mean it goes out of existence. It just means that they don't wanna deal with reality. They wanna live a fantasy, that they wanna act as if they never made that, that commitment or uh, established that bond. I like the way you said that, people think their choices make reality. That really, that's memorable. Um, for the one who's separated faithful, and the other one says these things, you know, I don't want to be married, the marriage is over. 
how does one, and this is more asking a question from your past, from the, from the priest, from the spiritual father perspective, if someone is praying, you know, we pray anything we ask for in God's will, it will be granted, you know, he'll, he'll do anything we ask for in his will. So here's your separated faithful spouse praying for reconciliation. They go months, they go years praying for reconciliation. So the question is, how do you balance the hope of maybe reconciliation with years of it not being reconciled? And it, I mean, it really seems like, well, you know, we went up the aisle, we made the marriage promises, we had some number of years of normal seeming marriage, we had kids. Mm -hmm. um, it, so it seems like it's definitely a good thing that we'd be reconciled and you're not year after year. Mm -hmm. What can you say to that person to encourage them? Yeah. First of all, we have to remember that our prayers are always answered, but one thing that God will not do and cannot do is, is violate our freedoms. You know, Jesus himself, the second person of the Blessed Trinity, prayed that the disciples would not abandon him. They all did in the Passion. He, he prayed uh, that Peter would, would not, you know, uh, deny him, but he did. You know, so even the Lord in his human nature... While he prayed earnestly for many things, we don't always see his prayers being answered because others have to cooperate with the grace they're offered. Now, God the Father offered the grace to the apostles to be faithful. He offered the grace even to Judas to, to convert. Uh, but uh, humans sometimes resist grace that has been offered to them. So our job is to be faithful and continue to pray for uh, those we want to see come back to the church, come back to their commitments to convert and be saved, but we can't force them and God won't force them. They do have that freedom. Um, so uh, that becomes a difficult situation of how to deal with being sinned against when one is um, not sinning oneself. Okay, good point. Um, another thing that's not unique to separated faithful, but it's really anyone who's experienced on the receiving end of an injustice, forgiving somebody. Um, it's one thing, you know, you see these beautiful stories on in courtrooms where somebody's committed a crime against somebody's daughter, and then the mom and dad are forgiving the criminal. But it was a one-time offense. With divorce and separation amongst the separated faithful, they say it's, it's the gift that keeps on giving mm -hmm. because it, it really, really does. It doesn't go away. I mean, you have a first communion, you have a baptism, you have a wedding, you have a holiday, somebody's, you know, your in-laws die. There's mm -hmm. always these awkward, uncomfortable situations where everyone's, it's like, it, it just, these things never stop. So mm -hmm. um, how does one forgive when the offense just keeps going and going? Yeah. Well, we have to be like the prodigal father in the story of the prodigal son. You know, it's, it's the father who's prodigious with his love. Uh, in that example, he's always ready to be reconciled. You know, he's ready to run out and embrace the son uh, and put the robe on him and the finger, the ring on his finger and sandals on his feet and restore him to sonship. You see, when someone is unfaithful and they, let's say they're unfaithful to the point of, of entering into a civil bond with another, um, that's an ongoing reality. It's, it's, it's something that they've made that choice. And we hope that that infidelity, that abandonment of their fir first marriage, their valid marriage, their sacramental marriage, for the sake of a, a civil union, that they'll come to their senses. Um, as a pastor, I, I have to be careful uh, uh, to keep it very vague, but I know of cases where men and women who are Catholic, who are in a second marriage, one civil marriage, but not the marriage they were in when they, um, you know, entered one sacramentally. I think of a case where both were, they prayed that they could be reconciled with God, this couple I'm thinking of. They really wanted to be reconciled, but they were too weak for whatever reason. They were too weak to say no to living in the adulterous relationship they were living. And, you know, they held out hope that they might convert before they died. And I pray as their pastor that they do have that grace, but they continue to live um, what we would say euphemistically in the past, we say living in sin, that's exactly what they're doing. They're choosing to live in an objectively sinful situation. And people do that all the time. Uh, you know, we, I guess we don't preach enough about the fact that sin has a power to grip someone and hold them in its, in its grasp. And it's not just people who are addicts. Obviously, addicts have that issue. It's people, you know, think of a, a businessman who is constantly running a crooked business 
or maybe you know a banker who's you know you know running these payday loan places where they're charging usurious interest and every day they're taking advantage of the poor to enrich themselves they've probably come up with all kinds of excuses to justify their their serious sin but objectively they're daily committing more and more serious sin we can only hope and pray that they come to their senses convert repent and convert and be saved because we know that if we uh, knowingly and willingly commit a serious sin, um, that we have separated ourselves from God's uh, embrace until the and, unless we can uh, unless we uh, convert. Yeah. That's interesting that you put the perspective of the pastor mm -hmm. looking at the people who are betraying God, so to speak, and how that's like for you. It's like we don't normally think of that perspective um, for this. I'm, I'm thinking, too, of the Our Father, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Mm -hmm. So do you have anything more you could add on how a separated, yeah. how a faithful spouse can forgive some? Can right. you forgive somebody when the offense is continuing? And can you say anything more on encouraging how that works? Because it seems... Right. What we're talking about is, is merciful love. So just like God loves the person, the person, if God quit loving the person, the person would cease to exist. God's love holds them in being. Um, that's when sometimes students ask me, how do you know God loves me? Because huh. you exist. <laughs> if he for a moment quit loving you, poof, you'd be gone you, because he holds us in existence. Um, so a merciful love means, again, I want, I will, and I work for the true good of you. So that means I want what's truly good for you. That's what a person does when they forgive. Now, part, if, if, let's say... Use my example of the, the payday loan person who's usurously taking advantage of the poor. To love them and to be willing to forgive them means I want them to repent of their uh, of their sin. But in their case, not just repent, to do, make reparation, right? Because part of their ch conversion will be reparation. So, you know, I, I sometimes say when uh, we're dealing with and when I'm teaching this about abuse, you know, the most loving thing that a wife that's being hit by her husband can do is call 911 because he has to face the consequences of his evil deeds so that he'll have a chance to convert and be saved. So part of loving and forgiving is wanting them to convert and be saved, not continue in their objectively sinful situation. Got it. Um, I have found that people who are defendants in no-fault divorce are probably experiencing one of the most difficult injustices that happens in Western culture. Because mm -hmm. um, their kids are taken from them, their finances are taken over by the government, the one who's promised to be true to good times and bad has betrayed them. And um, the, the, all the forces out there tell you this is normal and you should get with the program. What's wrong with you? What do you mean you're such a control freak that you have to stay married to this person who doesn't want to be right. married to you? And that kind of talk. So can you address suffering? And yeah. what what does one do with this suffering? A nun early in my situation had told me suffering either makes you bitter or it makes you better. So can you address from the, <laughs> from the Catholic yeah. perspective... Well, let's tell, that. first of all, let's not um, uh, gloss over in any way that there is an injustice being perpetrated by the no-fault divorce laws. They were disastrous, and quite frankly, the Catholic Church in America should have fought them more, uh, more strenuously. Uh, and some states, I understand, uh, some states are rethinking uh, no-fault divorce laws because uh, they recognize now uh, through space and time, and it's been a while since I've done the economic study on this, so uh, I can't say this is gospel truth, but back 20 years when I did do that study, when I was at the John Paul II Institute, um, it, what happens with no-fault divorce is the man's uh, economic, social economic standing usually goes up and the woman's goes down. So it's not a level playing field. Uh, and at that time, it was about uh, you know, for the man went up about a fifth, so, you know, about 20 percent, and the woman went down about a third, about, you know, was, you know, and often that meant that, you know, take a typical situation, you know, the, the family's living in the suburbs, you know, middle class family, they've got a mortgage, they have whatever, uh, you know, the split comes, you have to split the value of the house, so now they, they have to sell the house, 
uh, take out the value that's that's there, split it evenly. Um, well, the, usually the mother gets whatever children, as far as you know, taking care of them, even though it's a 50 50 percent they're taking care of. That usually means they have to move, and they usually move to a, a neighborhood that's worse, social economically, usually with less uh, access to you know good schools. And you know the studies are pretty clear that what happens in uh, no fault is usually the the woman and the children suffer, and the man, uh, if if at all, he, his situation can go up. He uh, uh, at worst he's at the at his back, you know the same. Um, and this is classically, you know, when the when the husband, I hate to be uh, stereotypical, but this is where, what the statistics show, the husband's office uh, uh, is sometimes trying to enter into a new relationship, uh, you know, perhaps with someone who's, you know, younger and also making an income. So you can see how this, so the, the, the no-fault laws uh, ended up hurting women and children. And uh, I, I, every study I looked at back when I was doing this, pointed to that reality. So there's a great injustice being done in the civil law. Uh, now, why did we go to no fault? Well, to, to, you know, when I was a kid and I didn't understand it because I was too young, you know, one of the more popular TV shows was Divorce Court because it was all this drama going on and people thought the drama wasn't good. But in fact, what the drama was pointing to was there was something real here. There was something that was a union that's being broken and it's being broken by by people's bad choices, um, and so um, so I just want to point out that a lot of what happens in no fault divorce settlements is are injustice. Can I interject something? Yes, because you're describing the situation where the man is the one who pr wants mm -hmm. the divorce, and right. you know at least if he goes off and finds a new woman, and I've heard that's yeah. usually the reason for the men. Um, also, there's a trend for women who are dumping the men and then mm -hmm. the men are in a situation where they're expected to pay child and spousal support in a home they're not allowed to live mm -hmm. and those men never wanted the divorce so they're in a terrible situation too and every once in a while I see about these horrible murder suicides where some man shot his wife and his children and himself and Sometimes they're the guy who's a defendant in divorce. And I'm like, I, yeah. I get it. It's really horrific. But anyways, the question was yeah. about how does, so we, we right. don't want to be shooting people, and we, but right. how does one Let's deal with suffering? suffering like what, how, what's you, the good of this? Those, those terrible cases are cases where people truly despair. They give up hope. And what your nun friend said to you is exactly right, that when we're dealing with injustice and injustice leads to suffering, how we deal with that, is um, either it's going to make us bitter or it's going to make us better. I like that. I'm going to steal that quotation because it's a good one. Um, we become bitter if one dwells on being hurt and makes oneself the quote unquote victim. You know, that, you know, we all have almost a cottage industry in our country of everybody wanting to be a victim so that they, they can stand on their victimhood often, you know, to put themselves in advantage, uh, either financially or otherwise. But we as Christians shouldn't see ourselves that way. We should see our, uh, that this is an opportunity to love. It's an opportunity to embrace and unite our suffering with that of Christ. Jesus promises us that if we faithfully follow him, that we will suffer. Now, is that because God's mean? No. In a world full of sin, a person who's trying to do the loving thing Love takes the form, in other words. We experience God's love as mercy, but when we try to live God's love, when we try to live agape love, it takes the form of the cross. And that's true in marriage. You know, every marriage has its difficulties, just like every vocation to holy orders has its difficulties. But um, some have more difficulties in the sense they're called to. So some priests are called to be martyrs. Some priests are called to go places where the church is persecuted. Um, but not all priests are called to that. And some marriages have more suffering than others. But we're all called to unite our suffering with that of Jesus, clearly taught by Paul, for example, in Colossians chapter 1. Um, you know, Jesus was betrayed. Can you think of any saints or historical figures that really dealt with betrayal in a way that was just admirable 
so that separated faithful could be encouraged yeah. by their model. Well, to be honest with you, I have this theory, and I, I, I can't prove it because I haven't looked at every life of the saint, but every life of the saint I've looked at closely, they go through the Stations of the Cross, including that station, which isn't up on the wall, but should be, where the disciples all run away, where the very people closest to them betray them. Think of Teresa of Avila was hated by her own sisters. John of the Cross was was locked up by his own order in a, in a cell not much bigger than a coffin. They only let him out once a day so they could beat him. And, you know, they wouldn't let him say mass, wouldn't let him say the office. And the only way he got out of that was escaping. You know, it's not like they let him go. You know, uh, Damien Amalekai, one of my favorites, uh, an American saint, you know, a, a foreigner who came here as a missionary, you know, uh, uh, Damien of Malachi, the leper priest, you know, he, his fellow priest had the weird theory that you could only get leprosy by sexual contact, of course, which was not true. And um, so they thought he was, you know, uh, lecherous. And they were, and some of them were jealous of him because he was getting donations from, you know, and Robert Louis Stevenson was writing a story about him and all that stuff. But when they went to, you know, he was very, he was a very sensitive soul and he would want to go to confession but they wouldn't get anywhere near him because he had leprosy. So think of it, you know, the perverse, you can only get this by sexual contact, but I won't get close to him because he has leprosy. They knew, you know, they, they weren't even consistent with their own thinking. But this very sensitive soul, the way he had to go to confession was row the boat out to the priest who would be on the supply ship and he'd have to shout out his sins to them publicly and receive absolution. So that's how he was treated by his own, by his own presbyterate, his own fellow priest. I, almost any saint I've looked at their life closely, and I see that they were treated at times unjustly by those closest to them. And I, and I swear that's the, you know, Jesus says, well, we were treated just like he was. That's the sharing in the station of the cross where the disciples all run away. So we can look to the saints and see this. And, in, in, you know, look how Padre Pio uh, was thought to be a fraud by many of his, his contemporaries, many people in his orders. Yeah, you know, you, you, you almost name a saint, and you can see that. Look at Thomas More, my my confirmation name. How his friends, the people he was closest to, and the people he served so so faithfully, like his good friend the king, uh, you know, turned their back on him and eventually had him killed. That's great. Um, another priest told me a long time ago that separated faithful encouraged priests in the vocation. I'm using the wrong language. But the idea of chastity, I remember being at a conference once where some woman, you know, was seeing what the exhibitor's table was about. And I was there for Separated Faithful. And she's like, why would you ever do that? Oh, my goodness. People have to have sex. It's like you have to. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, this is this is one of the great lies. Of course, I way back in the 90s, last millennium, uh, I was appointed by my bishop to serve on a school board, a secular school board uh, uh, that was trying to put um, a, a sex ed program into the, the big school system in, in this is in the Illinois, uh, central Illinois. And they, you know, they went a representative from all the different you know, types of, of, uh, uh, of, uh, people in the community. And I got chose to be the Catholic representative. And the assumption was in the sex ed they were going to teach in these high schools was that, that the kids were going to have sex. So since the kids were going to have sex, we've got to teach them all these birth control methods and everything. And I pointed out that that very school had programs that, you know, I said, well, let's be consistent. If you, if you think they're, 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 they're going to have sex anyhow, you know, you, you tell them not to smoke and not to do drugs, but you can't imagine they, they have the strength to say no to drugs or no to smoking. They don't have the strength to say no to sex. So we better teach them how to shoot up. You know, I said, let's add some chapters in here that teaches them how to shoot up because we want them to be safe when they shoot up. Since it's inevitable, they're going to shoot up. I mean, we never teach anything else that way. We think sex is the thing that you know, that we humans are just animals. We have no control on our passions, and therefore, you know, we we have to give in to them. You know, Oscar Wilde that some temptations can only be gotten rid of by giving in to them. Um, you know, that's not the language of saints, and you know, um, it's inconsistent that we don't teach any other ethics this way. Like, you know, you know. Well, you know, you can't really expect someone to love their enemies. You can't really expect someone to not be hateful and strike out and hit their their neighbor. Well, of course you can expect them to, and we demand that they 
And, and so all of these things we demand following the moral code. Uh, the fact we've abandoned a moral code on sex and, and, and sexuality is undermining the health and well-being of our society. Do you think, like, do you think, I mean, I kind of know this already, but if you have more to add to it, to, maybe 150 years ago in the United States, if you had a husband leave his wife because he was interested in some sweet young thing somewhere, or if you had a, you know, a, a woman who's 50 who's just fallen out of love with her husband and she just can't be with him anymore and, and she wants to keep the kids, make him pay her, how would the church have responded back decades and decades ago? Well, it wasn't just the church. Let me tell you about my childhood growing up in rural Pennsylvania. There was only one divorced man in our entire town. It was a town that was dominated by uh, farmers. My parents owned the, the general store, cleverly called the general store. Uh, it was the only store in town other than the hardware store and the grange mill, you know, that, that, that grind the, the grain. We had a bank and a post office and some churches, but, you know, 90 some percent of the people were farmers. There was only one divorced man in the entire community of about 600 uh, souls, and he was shunned. No one would speak to him. Um, and I knew this because as a kid, uh, I'd be in the store, and he'd come in the store, and that little bell would ring over the door. And when he walked in, everybody got silent. They looked down at their – no one would interact with him. Now, I don't want us to go back to that. I don't think that was a healthy way of society dealing with uh, a divorced person. But that's the way it was. Now, my mom would interact with him. Matter of fact, he, he had great affection for my mom and dad because they didn't treat him uh, as a pariah. But the entire town wouldn't talk to him. That's the way it was. That was the early 60s. You know, and that's how quickly we went from this being something that's so serious that he has broken the community standard of covenant relationship as a community, he's basically excommunicated as far as the... Can I interject with a question? Yeah, yeah. Do you know if that man was the one who perpetrated the separation? It's like the catechism yeah. talks about the one who's yeah. the victim of a divorce versus the one who's yeah. the perpetrator, and there's a distinction. Yeah, I, I don't... I was too young to know okay, the backstory. Maybe you know, they and, didn't make a distinction at all back then, because yeah. I hear people yeah. concerned, oh, divorced people can't get yeah. communion. It's like, wait a minute. Yeah. Wouldn't it be the one who abandoned right. the marriage who couldn't get communion? Right. So anyway, and back to the obviously, history. Obviously, if a, if a couple separates for, for, for legitimate reasons or illegitimate reasons, but then are, is reconciled and are living separate uh, with the permission of the bishop, they could, go, they could receive communion. It's the remarriage that makes it sinful um, for them. Now, they should be working at reconciling, and that's hopefully that's what couples do that separate, that they have a pastoral that someone's working with them, a pastoral plan to help that couple come back together. But, um, I, you know, there was a period of time when there was this real kind of shunning in society that, you know, divorce is just not something you did. Now, now that I'm an adult, I, I recognize, and I didn't know it back as a child, that there were families where, you know, the husband and wife were, for all practical purposes, living separate in the same house, but they wouldn't divorce for the sake of the kids and for the sake of propriety. Uh, and they they stuck it out, even though it was one of those four worst situations. Um, I, I think it was a healthier time than what we have today. Now, hopefully there's some kind of happy medium where we can deal with people who have through weakness or through bad choices or whatever made wrong choices, that we can help and serve them. Um, but at the same time, we can support those who are living out their commitment to marriage, be it a good marriage or a difficult one. Could you address anything as to um, why would a separated faithful person want to do this for their children? What do you think the perspective of children is when they, when they see parents divorcing and either both of them think we're not married anymore and they're free to go find someone else in contrast to a situation where one person remains faithful from the yeah. kid's perspective? Right. First of all, I do have to say, and this is why couples who are having difficulty in marriage should do everything they can to try to stay together. That, again, I'm, I, I'm going back to my studies in the 90s, but when I did this, I don't think it's changed that much. The effects, the psychological and spiritual effects on children in divorce, that, and this is hard to believe, but it's what the social science showed back then, and I would assume it, it's similar today, is that it was easier for a child to deal with the death of one of their parents, psychologically and, and, and spiritually, than it was for them to deal with a divorce. 
And almost always there'll be some sublimation in the child's life where they think they're partly at fault for the divorce. Now you say, that's crazy, why is that? But that is what the social science says, that there, that a divorce is harder on children than even dealing with the death of one of their, one of their parents. So uh, we have to recognize this is a devastating thing to do because for, for kids, you're disrupting everything. The one thing they can count on is their family's unity. And when that falls out, they become very much either consciously or subconsciously fearful that everything's gonna fall apart constantly. And I think a lot of the students I served had that pathology that they thought they had to prove they were lovable. And of course, you know, we have the further problem in our society because children today know that they might not have been chosen. We live in a society where, where a child's life is not a given, that a third of children today were eliminated before they were born through abortion. So children already are dealing with the pathology. They feel they have to prove they were worthy of choice. For children of, of a divorced family, they also feel they have to prove they're lovable. These are difficult things. And so we should recognize it's devastating on children. However, it, you know, grace can heal all things. And the supernatural witness and grace of a faithful parent in a situation of infidelity can assure children that it's possible to make commitments, keep them and live them out. And that's an important witness, uh, especially for young people today. Great. Um We've been good. That was a fast 40 minutes, Monsignor. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, I, I hope I, I have a tendency. I'm a teacher. I have a tendency to ramble sometimes. So no, I hope I didn't um, uh, go too far afield with those questions. Do you have any other things that just come into your mind as encouragement or for a separate? Well, you did mention about, you know, this, this symbiotic relationship that people who struggle and are faithful to their marital vows aid uh, the witness of priests you know, trying to live out their commitments. And it's vice versa too. So we do support one another. And there's even groups out there that, um, you know, especially the people who, who are praying for priests. Uh, so that's sometimes an apostolate that some people who have suffered can take on, that they pray for priests who are struggling themselves. Uh, they, they, you know, people who, who know that um, what it's like to be, um, you know, to suffer and may be able to offer that suffering, uh, that priest might be faithful. So it's one thing to think of as you're looking for an apostle of what do I do with this suffering to make it apply it to that particular intention. Uh, there's even a group, uh, Ray Piartrix, who uh, that I know of, one group where people offer their suffering specifically for priests. Uh, but there's there's um, ways of doing that for any of the, the many needs in our world today. All right, great, I'll keep that in mind. Well, I'm going to wrap up. Thank you so Thanks. much. I'm going to stop Thanks. the record.